This is going to be Romans chapter 4, verse by verse. Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we then, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. So he couldn't glory before God. Abraham believed God about his seed in Genesis 15. But many times a non-dispensationalist will take you here and see, say, See, Abraham was justified by grace through faith when he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But what this is talking about is Abraham believed God about his seed in Genesis 15, 5 through 6. And the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. God said, God basically told him that he's going to have kids and they're going to be, there's going to be so many that you can't even count. And Abraham believed God and then God counted it to him for righteousness. And his justification wasn't complete until he offered up Isaac on the altar in Genesis 22. So there you have a separation. Genesis 15 is when he believed God about his seed. And then Genesis 22 is when he offered up Isaac. So he had already gotten righteousness before he even offered up Isaac. And then James 2, 21 through 22 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac, on the, his son, upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? Now many people will say, This just shows how us Christians today are justified in the eyes of men, and our faith is made perfect. And that's okay, but that's only looking at the practical aspect of the verse. But doctrinally, what I mean, what's it saying? Uh, Abraham's faith was different than ours because it needed perfecting. Uh, I, my, my faith doesn't need perfecting. My faith is perfect because it's in a perfect person. Uh, I got everything the moment I believed the gospel. I got indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I was justified. Uh, my justification didn't need to be fulfilled or perfected because I got it all at once. And when you talk like this, people think that you're you're a false teacher because they think you're saying that Abraham got to heaven some other way. But that's not what I'm saying because you're forgetting something. Abraham didn't go to heaven. He went to paradise in the heart of the earth. And he didn't have eternal salvation because the Lord Jesus Christ hadn't even shed his blood making it possible for him to have eternal salvation. Uh, Abraham wasn't in the body of Christ because Jesus Christ hadn't even come in the flesh and died yet. Uh, he didn't. He wasn't sealed until the day of redemption. Every non-dispensationalist even, even a non-dispensationalist knows that in the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost was working different. It would come and go. Uh, they weren't sealed until the day of redemption. Abraham didn't have the spiritual circumcision. He had the physical circumcision. So there's a lot of different things between Abraham and me. Now, the way God gave Abraham righteousness was by grace through faith. But it was by grace through faith and something different. Uh, he promised Abraham something. He promised him Palestine. He promised him the land. Uh, he promises us heaven. And what Abraham did when he offered up Isaac is not what got him eternal salvation. And it isn't what got him to the third heaven. But it certainly got him to paradise in the heart of the earth. Now, if he died between Genesis 15 when he believed God about his seed, if he died between Genesis 15 and 22, Genesis 22 when is when he offered up Isaac, he would have went to paradise in the heart of the earth. I'm not doubting that for a second. And now Abraham was a man before the law. And he was counted righteous for believing God about his seed. And you can read that in Genesis 15, 5 through 6. And he wasn't saved. You could say he was safe. You could say he was righteous. But being saved is, a, is more of a New Testament thing when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ we're saved we're eternally secure nothing can change that and Abraham wasn't redeemed the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that purchased the sinner when he believes on him hadn't been shed yet so Abraham was not born again 
He didn't have the spiritual circumcision. And he didn't have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ hadn't come in the flesh and lived a perfect, sinless life. But Abraham was counted righteous by God, by grace, through faith. So he was safe. And he would go to the heart of the earth and wait on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he could get his sins forgiven. Now Romans 4, three says, For what saith the Scripture? Notice Paul is a Bible believer. He believes in the Scriptures. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And I've already went over what Abraham believed. But like I said, this is a favorite for non-dispensationalists and many even dispensationalists to teach that Abraham was saved by grace through faith and looking forward to the cross. And there are a lot of great men who are non-dispensationalists and men who are dispensationalists that I'd, I wouldn't break fellowship with them over something like this, over this petty disagreement. But as I already said, Abraham believed God about his seed in Genesis 15, 5 through 6. He was counted righteous at that moment before he even offered up Isaac his son. And when he offered up Isaac his son in Genesis 22, the non-dispensationalist would, would teach he's looking forward to the cross. Because in John 8, 56, it says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, if, even if Abraham was looking forward to the cross when he offered up Isaac, he already was counted righteous in Genesis 15 when he believed God about his seed. So even if he was looking forward to the cross in Genesis 22, he had already gotten righteous in Genesis 15 before he would have looked forward to the cross, as they say. Let's just read Genesis 15, 5 through 6 and show you. I'm just going to show you what Abraham believed. Okay, Genesis 15, 5 through 6. And it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. That means count the stars. If thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So does that say he looked forward to the cross, and God counted it to him for righteousness? Does it say he called on the name of the Lord Jesus, and he counted it to him for righteousness? No, he believed the Lord. It says, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it for righteousness. So what did he believe the Lord about? About his seed. And everyone will call you a false teacher if you're saying this. But I'm not showing you anything except what those verses said. And let me remind you, Abraham believing about his seed isn't what gained him eternal salvation. He was made righteous and was safe until the perfect sacrifice would come and die for his sins. Now Romans 4.4 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. So this is saying if you get anything from God because you worked for it, then it's, it's not by grace, it's, it's by debt, because God would be owing you something. But it's the other way around. Once you get born again, you owe God your Christian service. God doesn't owe you anything. It's by grace. Uh, Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So a man's works before he is saved, and a man's works after he is saved are a completely separate issue than the salvation itself. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we don't work to get saved, and we don't work to stay saved. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So the one who we believe in that justifies the ungodly is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts 16.31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It says in John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So the object of my faith is in a perfect person, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm justified by him. Justified like just if I'd never sinned. And when God justifies a man, that means that man is declared righteous. And the difference between that and imputed righteousness is that imputed righteousness is the act of God giving you the righteous record of Jesus Christ, putting that on your account, and then not applying your unrighteousness to your account. So Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, 
but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So do you want to be justified? Who gets justified according to the verse? The ungodly. So everyone who gets saved must know they are lost. Uh, they just they need to know that they've sinned against a holy God and have offended God. Because the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 3.23. But Romans 4, 5 says your faith is counted for righteousness. So not your water baptism, not your living a good life, not your changed life, not your fruit, your faith. Uh, Romans 4, 6, even as David des also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So David had something that most Old Testament saints under the law didn't have, and that is something called the sheer mercies of David. Because David committed adultery and murder. Under the law, those two things were punishable by death. And there was no sacrifice you could do for those sins. However, Nathan told David that the Lord had put away his sin. The Lord didn't put those sins on David's account. David was one of the only men in the Old Testament with a form of eternal security. His eternal security wasn't like ours. But God's mercy didn't leave David. At Romans 4, 7 says, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That's what David said. And in the New Testament, your sins aren't just covered, they are taken away. Those bloody animal sacrifices in the Old Testament could never take away sin. According to Hebrews 10, 4, it says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So the sacrifices only gave the Old Testament saint temporary forgiveness. And he never had his sins cleared. According to Exodus 34, 7, where it says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So those Old Testament saints couldn't have eternal salvation until Jesus Christ shed his blood. Anyone, any of them who got to the third heaven got there because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because any of their works. And when Jesus Christ was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, he preached to those men in hell and he preached to the Old Testament saints in paradise, which was also in the heart of the earth. And you can read about that in Luke 16, about paradise, a place in the heart of the earth where Lazarus and Abraham both were. And when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he took some, if not most, of the Old Testament saints with him. He led captivity captive. Ephesians 4, 8 through 10 talks about this, and it says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and appeared unto many. And there is a verse you don't hear preached at church much. But in Matthew 27, 52 and 53, it says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. When you're doing your Bible reading, that's one of those verses you just... I don't think people really stop and think about what they just read. But that's an incredible event that happened in the Bible. But you don't hear anybody. I don't know that I've heard any preacher talking about that really. Except for just a couple. But many will deny the fact that the Old Testament saints went to the heart of the earth when they died. But it's clearly shown, as I said in Luke 16. And Ezekiel even talks about the nether parts of the earth. Talking about the the trees of Eden and those that drink water in the nether parts of the earth in Ezekiel 31. And I clearly see in the Bible that there are two sides of hell before the cross, at least before the cross. You got a, a side of torment and you got paradise. And Samuel, when he gets uh, called up, it even says back there, it says, bring me up Samuel. So Saul was Saul knew about paradise. And now David says in Romans 4, 8, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So imputed righteousness has to do with you receiving Christ's righteousness. 
and God not imputing your righteousness to your record. Or, excuse me, imputing your unrighteousness to your record. You need the righteousness of God because yours is no good. And the Old Testament saints, they had their own righteousness. They didn't have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. But even their righteousness wasn't good enough to gain them eternal salvation. Now, Romans 10.3 says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So you can't get righteousness, real righteousness, any other way than believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 4 9 cometh this blessedness. The blessedness is the imputed righteousness. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So this blessedness comes on anyone who chooses to get in on it. God is a whosoever will God. And the uncircumcised, which would be the Gentiles, along with the circumcised, which would be the Jews, they both have to come the same way, and that's by faith. If they die in unbelief, both Jews and Gentiles, no matter what, end up in hell if they die in unbelief. Faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And Romans 4.10 says, How was it then reckoned? When he was in uncircumcision? When he, I mean, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So what this is saying is, Abraham got righteousness in Genesis 15, and Abraham didn't get circumcised until Genesis 17. Genesis 17.10-11 through 11 says, This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So Abraham was given righteousness in Genesis 15, and he wasn't circumcised until Genesis 17. So Abraham got righteousness before he was circumcised. So what's out for those who say you need to be circumcised to get in on the gift of God or that you need to be baptized to get on, get in on salvation? Because today it's not circumcision they push on you. They claim the water baptism is necessary for salvation today. And that's the big thing now. Now Romans 4.11 says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed to them also. So he received the sign of circumcision. Uh, circumcision for Abraham was like water baptism is for us today. It's, uh, it's just showing people that you've, made an, you've stepped out by faith, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the circumcision for Abraham was just showing that he was one of God's men and that they were God's people. It was a sign between God and Israel. And you see that this circumcision is a sign. It's a sign between God and the Jews. And you know what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians one twenty two? It says the Jews require a sign. And Abraham was the first Jew in the Bible. And it started with that circumcision. That was the covenant between them and God. The circumcision was a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. And we don't need this today because we're sealed by the Holy Ghost. Sealed into the day of redemption by the Holy Ghost. Now Romans 4.12 or Romans 4.11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So Abraham is not only father to Jews, he is also our spiritual father. He is the father of all them that believe. And the Gentiles can get imputed righteousness just like the Jew. And then when you are saved, spiritually speaking... You are neither Jew nor Gentile, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. Spiritually speaking, I'm neither Jew or Gentile. Physically, I didn't lose the fact that I'm a Gentile physically. But spiritually, I'm neither Jew nor Gentile. Now Romans 4.12 says, And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, 
which he had being yet uncircumcised. So when you place your faith in Christ, you walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. And this doesn't mean Abraham believed on Christ when he was alive, because I already showed you what he believed in Genesis 15. But if you want to believe that he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you go right ahead. Uh, I don't make it that big of a deal about it. But the same way Abraham got righteousness through faith while being uncircumcised is the same way that man today gets righteousness through faith, whether he is circumcised or uncircumcised. Now, Romans 4.13 says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Uh, when Abraham believed God about his seed, uh, he became just like Noah was when he got off the ark. Uh, Noah was king of the kingdom of heaven at that time, and now Abraham is the king when he believed God about his seed. That's what the entire Bible is about, kings and kingdoms. Back then at that time, Abraham was king of the kingdom of heaven. It says that he should be the heir of the world. Right now in the church age, the kingdom of heaven, there is no kingdom of heaven. It's about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is an earthly physical kingdom. And when Jesus is here, they're both here. When Jesus was present on earth, they were both here. They were both at hand. In the millennium, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are both here. A spiritual and physical kingdom. But God promised that Abraham, God promised Abraham that he would be heir of the world. And this was before the law. Under the law, the nation of Israel had the land conditionally on whether or not they stuck with the Lord and had the works. But the promise never went away. There was always the unconditional promise that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had with their seed. There was always the pro unconditional promise that that seed would get the land. Now Romans four fourteen and 15 says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. So the idea is, if a person doesn't even know the law, they don't know they are sinner, so the Lord doesn't put the sin to their account. For where no law is, there is no transgression. So the Lord doesn't put the sin to their account. For example, a two-year-old kid doesn't know he's a sinner. He may know he does wrong because his parents yell at him, but he doesn't understand that he is a sinner against God. And for this reason, he would go to heaven if he died. Because where no law is, there is no transgression. Now Romans 4.16 it says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. During the millennial reign, saints in the body of Christ will also get in on the land. Second Timothy 2.12 says, For if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. However, this does not mean that the church replaces the physical seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Romans 4.17 says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now look at that word quicken. God quickens the dead. Quicken means to make alive. And in this case, God is going to quicken the parts of Abraham and Sarah that kept them from having children. And Abraham believed he would. So in Romans 4.18 it says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might be become the father of many nations. Talking about Abraham. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So Abraham, against hope, believed in hope. Meaning, even though it seemed far-fetched for him to have a son and a kids in his old age, he still had hope. Against hope, but he believed in hope. Now Romans 4, 19 and 20. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, even though he was uh, old, because it says when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. So the Lord points out the good things of the lives of the Old Testament saints in the New Testament. 
as you can see. Because at one point, Abraham laughs when the Lord tells him that he is going to have a son in his old age. And Sarah also laughs. But the Lord only mentions how Abraham staggered not at the promise of God and says he was strong in faith. So even though Abraham and Sarah were old, he considered not his body dead. He, he considered her womb not dead. He knew the Lord would quicken the parts of them that they needed to have kids. Romans 4.21 says, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Abraham was fully persuaded. And that's what... That's the way we need to be about our salvation, fully persuaded. Is anything too hard for God? If God promises something, it will come to pass. And Abraham was so persuaded that the Lord was going to go through with the promise that he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. Showing that Abraham believed in the resurrection of his son. Romans 4.22 says, And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Notice these verses, even plainly teaching, Abraham believed God about his seed and got righteousness this way. Even though men today will insist that Abraham placed his faith in the cross to get righteousness. Which is just, that's because they're not going back and reading it. They're taking what they learned at church or by their favorite preacher and just reading the Bible through the lens of their favorite preacher. But if you go back and read it in Genesis 15 and really say, this is what Abraham believed and how he got righteousness, then you'll know how he got righteousness. Now Romans 4, 23 and 24 says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Notice the contrast. Righteousness is imputed to us if we believe on him that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. But what is this? even this chapter said? It said Abraham was, was given righteousness when he staggered not at the promise of God about his seed. It explained that to you very clearly. And then Romans 4.25 says, Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So Jesus Christ died for our sins. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, and was raised up the third day. So Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And putting our trust in that gospel, that bloody gospel where Jesus Christ died on the cross shedding his blood, that's how we're saved and that's how we get eternal life.